when disaster strikes, when a loved one is hurting, when somebody close to you has lost somebody in their lives, and you are in the room, and they know who you are, and you're a Christian, and uh, you love the Lord, and they have all these hard questions. Why does this happen? Maybe they phrase it in different ways. Why did God take my loved one, my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, my parents? Why did God, if they don't say, why did God take, why did God allow this to happen? Those are tough questions. I don't know how to answer those a lot of times, but I hear people give answers sometimes. And sometimes we say things like, well, it must be part of God's plan. It must be part of God's will that this terrible, awful, horrible thing happened to you and to your family. It must be part of God's plan for that. I'm not so sure about that. We're going to talk about it this morning. Or people say things like, well, I guess God needed them more. Well, I'm not so sure that God needs that either. So how do we come to these ideas? That's a question that has challenged my thinking for a while. How do we come to the idea where we attribute a lot of evil to God's will when that seems, you know, con uh, contrary to who God is? How do we attribute pain and suffering to what God wants for our lives. And I know there, there are some circular reasoning kind of exercises we could get to, to to maybe make that make sense. But I'm left with this idea of, seriously, that's that's where we are. That's, that's where we get to with this idea of pain and suffering is that God wants that for us, that God uh, desires that for us. That's kind of a strange thought. It boils down to this idea that does God make things evil? Does God make evil things, a God of love and grace, mercy and compassion, makes evil, desires, wills evil into place. Those are some really, for me at least, those are some difficult discussions, difficult thoughts. And it has been for a long time. We're going to kind of reverse the order a little bit of how we've done these sermons for this one, because it just makes sense. But we've talked about two names, Augustine and John Calvin. They both had thoughts about this. On the screen are some words that Augustine wrote about 1,700 years ago. And he said, evil, by the way we think of it, does not exist at all. And he says, and not for you, God, for you, for your created universe, because there is nothing outside it which could break in and destroy the order which you have imposed upon it. You read between the lines, what Augustine is hinting at is that whatever happens is because God willed for that, God is... God, in his sovereignty, his power, has willed for that to happen. And that leads to about uh, 12 centuries later, John Calvin writing some words about how can we talk about Job, how can we attribute this story or this same work to God, to Satan, and to man, the suffering of Job? How can we, how can we lay the burden on God, Satan, and man without making God the author of evil? And then he later says, God's purpose is that he is glorified through our genuine faith. And so Calvin would, would lead to the idea that um, through suffering and evil and pain in our world, God somehow is glorified by how Christians react to that. Well, they use a lot of writings to, to get to these philosophies and get to these thoughts. We're going to center on one this morning and ask that same question. Is it really that, that God is to blame for what happens, you know, negatively in our lives? Is God to blame for what happens in the story of of Job. Let me give you a, a quick rundown of who Job is. Um, in the time that he lived, he apparently is like literally the greatest man on the planet. That's kind of what God says. And so Job has a good family. He's got a lot of children. He's wealthy. He's got a lot of livestock. He's got a nice place, nice house, nice possessions. And almost in an instant, he loses every bit of it. Maybe you know the story, but maybe you don't. And so really quickly, Job goes through this extremely terrible time of loss. And he loses his stuff, his possessions, he loses his farm, he loses his uh, livestock, his animals. I mean, not just like 10 or 12 of them, thousands of them. He eventually loses his family, his children, perish in a building collapse. His wife, all the while, is saying, Job, this is terrible, why don't you just curse God and die? Eventually, Job loses his health. All right, it's, it's terrible. I mean, he's a picture of literally the best guy on the planet, one who, you know, strays away from evil, who seeks God, and he's cursed with all of these things, and he has all these disasters that happen one after the other in his life, even so far as losing his health and his children, everything is gone. 
Lucky for Job, he's got a few friends who come beside him, and his friends have some thoughts. At first, they sit around for about seven days. Job is sitting there around the campfire, I guess, scraping his skin with uh, scraps of pottery and trying to make his boils feel a little bit better. I don't know how that works, but they're there for seven days in silence. They don't say anything. And the story gets worse when they open their mouths and start talking. Because really, their mindset is, Job, we think this is your fault. And so I'm just going to pick out a couple of verses here, but, but you know, phrases like this and passages like this show up from Job's, quote, friends all through the book. And they have these ideas that Job somehow is the one who's to blame here, that Job is messed up, he's got some unrepentant sin in his life. And just think for a second, he just lost everything. Like seven days ago, all his kids died. Seven days ago, his house was destroyed. Seven days ago, he lost his health. Seven days ago, his wife is saying, just you need to die. You're better off dead, Job. Seven days ago, his world crashed. And his friends come and say, well, it's, it's your fault, Job. Remember, who that was innocent ever perished. In other words, Job, I know it's only been seven days, but if you didn't do anything wrong, this wouldn't have happened to you. Or where were the upright cut off? Job, if you were righteous as we thought you were, then you wouldn't have lost everything. As I've seen, Eliphaz continues, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Put this in context. This guy just literally lost everything. And they're saying, well, you're, you're getting what was coming to you, Job. Over and over, that's their thought through the whole thing. By the breath of God, they perish, and by the blast of his anger, they are consumed. Job, you've messed up so badly that God is angry with you, and so he has wrecked your family, he's killed your children, he has destroyed your livelihood. That's the mindset of Job's friends. That's their thoughts. You brought this upon yourself. Look at Job chapter 5, and I think all these verses are going to be on the screen here. Job 5, verses 17 and 18. All right? They say, hey, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe God's got a plan for this, in other words. Behold, he says, blessed is the one whom God reproves. This is God teaching you a lesson, Job. You need to learn the lesson, Job. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. He wounds, but he binds up. He shatters in his hands. They heal. He continues in the same chapter, verses 19 through 21. He'll deliver you from all these troubles. No evil shall touch you. In famine, he'll redeem you from death. And in war from the power of the sword, you'll be hidden from all these things. At destruction and famine, you'll laugh. Seven days ago, he lost everything. And now they're saying, Job, if you'll just get your life right, God's going to make this all right. He's got a better plan for you. He's got a will for your life. Let's skip ahead and look at chapter 6. Job says, hey, this is what y'all are doing, all right? If you look at chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, he very clearly says, talking about other people, they're ashamed because they were confident. They come there and they're disappointed for you've now become nothing. You see my calamity, friends, and you are afraid. Job hits the issue of, that these friends have going on. They've come around for seven days. They sat around. They didn't say anything. Then they opened their mouth and said, Job, if you would just get your life right, you know, you brought this upon yourself. If you'll correct it, repent of your sins, get your life right, then God's going to take it all away and God's going to be good to you. Job says, you're saying this because you are afraid. You see my calamity. You know I'm a righteous guy. You know I shun evil. You know I try to do the right thing. You see what happened to me, and you're trying to explain it away because you're afraid that it's going to happen to you. It's arbitrary in your minds. Why did this happen to Job? We don't know. It's got to be something sinful in his life. Let's just hope it doesn't happen to us. Job calls him out and says, you're thinking this way because you're afraid of what could happen to you. This mindset goes throughout the entire book. Finally, Job is, is going to have his meeting with God, and, and we're jumping ahead a little bit, but God's going to respond to the complaints of these friends. Here's what he says in Job 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, he's the one who was speaking in chapter 4 and chapter 5. My anger burns against you, not Job. My anger, God says, burns against you and against your two friends, Bildad and Zophar, for you've not spoken of me what is right. That sums it up. All right? God says, I heard everything you said to Job. 
You said it was his fault. You said if, that he'd messed something up in his life, and so I, my anger was poured out on him. You said if he would just confess it and repent of it, then I would make everything right. And God said, my anger is not with Job. My anger is with you because you have not spoken of me what is right. That whole idea that Job got what was coming to him, he deserved everything God gave him there, God allowed to happen there. God said, that's not how it works. You spoke out of your ignorance. God's angry at them for their misunderstanding, their lack of knowledge here, okay? Well, if it's not Job, if Job's not to blame here, then maybe God's to blame. Is it that God is to blame? Well, Job is the one who's the speaker in these next uh, five or six verses that you'll have on your screen. I want you to see Job's idea. Now, let me preface this by saying, in the very front of the book, there's one little passage about how in all of uh, Job's speaking, he did not blame God, did not curse God, did not sin against God. Well, that's in chapter 1, and there are 41 more chapters. That phrase you read about in chapter 1 summarizes what happened to Job at that point. When you read these comments, maybe your mind changes a little bit. Look at what Job says about God. Chapter 9, verse 23, when disaster brings sudden death, he, God, mocks. That doesn't sound like the God I know. Job says, God mocks at the calamity of the innocent. Sound like the gods you know? The earth is given into the hand of the wicked, and he covers the faces of its judges. If it's not him, if it's not God, well, then who is it? He mocks his people when they suffer. That's Job's mindset. Look at chapter 10. Your hands, God, they fashioned and they made me, and now you have destroyed me. You've destroyed me? Altogether. Remember, he says, you made me like clay and you'll return me to the dust. He skipped down to verse 20. Are not my days few? Then stop and leave me alone that I may find a little bit of cheer. God, I'm angry and upset right now, Job says. You have stolen my joy. You've taken my cheer away. Just leave me alone. That's Job's mindset. Go to chapter 16, verses 7 through 9. Surely now, Job says, God has worn me out. He's made me desolate, all my company. He shriveled me up. This is the God that Job's talking about, which is a witness against me. My leanness has risen up against me. It testifies to my face. He has torn me in his wrath. God has hated me, Job says. He's gnashed his teeth at me. My adversary, who he would say is God, sharpens his eyes against me. Man, Job, what a mindset. Chapter 24. Why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? And why do those who know him never see his days? From out of the city, the dying groan and the soul of the wounded cries for help. But God is nowhere to be found, he says. God charges no one with wrong. And then chapter 30, with great force, Job says, My garments disfigured, disfigured it binds me about like the collar of my tunic. You, God, have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. Now you tell me, did Job speak against God or not? When you read that little passage in Job chapter 1, he hadn't at that point. But when you read the rest of the book, he absolutely does. And so God responds to him in chapter 42. And uh, God lets him know, basically, how this is going to shake out. Look at what he says in uh, chapter 42. Let's begin at verse 2. Job answers the Lord and he says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, Job says in verse 3 of, of chapter 42, I have uttered what I did not understand. All those things that I talked about here, like, in Job 30 and 16 and 24 and 9 and 10, I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Skip down to verse 6. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Repent of what? If he didn't speak against God, if he didn't challenge God with any of these thoughts, what is he turning away from? I right, go back to the very beginning of the book very quickly here, chapter 1. I want you to see what happens. In Job chapter 1, verse 21, this is the phrase that gets a lot of us tripped up sometimes because Job, we look at this and we say, the Lord gave, 
and the Lord has taken away, and I will still praise the Lord, that verse continues, or blessed be the name of the Lord. And that sounds great. It almost sounds like you could twist it a bit and provide comfort to somebody with Job's words. Hey, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away, but we will still praise the Lord. Problem with that is that that's the same mindset that Job reiterates in chapters 9, 10, 16, 24, and 30, and all over the rest of the book, when he says, God, why are you doing this? He says, God, you gave, God, you take away, and what he's essentially saying is, God, you know, through the rest of the book, you don't care about us? You are, like, literally, he calls him, you are my adversary? That's what he's saying there. God, you are, like, seeking my destruction? You are putting your hands on me and forsaking me. You are a predator trying to devour me. You are this person who is mocking the ones that you supposedly love. That's what Job is saying. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And Job is saying through the rest of the book, so God must be my adversary. God must be forsaking me. God must be destroying my life. He's a predator trying to devour me. He's mocking me. And if you're asking me, that sounds a lot more like Satan the adversary, than a God who describes himself as love, mercy, grace, and kindness. And when you read the book as a whole, what you figure out is this attitude in Job 121 and the rest of the book, that attitude is the very mindset that Job repents of at the end. This idea that God is against him, that God is to blame for his struggles. Job gets away from that line of thinking by the end of the book. He says, I talked about things that I didn't have any idea about. I uttered things that I did not understand, things that were too wonderful uh, for me that only you know, God, and so I repent in dust and ashes. Repent of what? From blaming God for my situation. And so in the last four chapters of the book, God gives a great response to both of these mindsets. And really, he talks about the friends who said, well, Job's got to be to blame. And he talks about Job who says, well, God's got to be to blame. And so here's, here's how it goes. God says, Job, uh, let me, you've had your say. Let me have mine. And so he says, Job, you have absolutely no idea about what happens in creation. You got no idea about the vastness of creation. You got no idea about the complexity of the creation that you are living in. So he says, like in Uh, 38, starting at verse 4. Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, Job, who stretched the line upon it. On what were the bases sunk? Who laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? What would you do about that, Job? Tell me what you know about all these ideas, Job. Look at verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, Job? Have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare it to me if you know this. If you can answer these questions, Job, you let me know. Verse 24, what is the way to the place where the light is distributed? Can you tell me where light comes from, Job? That's what he's saying. Where does the east wind scattered upon the earth? Can you tell me where the wind comes from, Job? Verse 33, Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? And he goes on and on. And he says, Job, 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 you've tried to explain this thing away. You've tried to blame me. But Job, you have no idea about creation. You've got no idea about the complexity of the universe and the vastness of the creation that God has given. That's not the only thing God says. He says, Job, you've got no idea about creation. But also, Job, you have no idea about the battles that I'm fighting for you. If you're still in chapter 38, look at verse 8. Who shut the sea with doors when it burst from the womb? When I made a cloud, its garments and thick darkness, its swaddling swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. He's talking about the sea. And to ancient Near Eastern peoples, the sea was a place of chaos and destruction. And God says, Job, let me tell you about the sea, the waters. I shut them up. I stopped them. 
I am, God says, the reason that they are separated and not consuming you and drowning you and your family right now. I'm fighting that battle for you, Job. You have no idea, Job. What's going on behind the scenes? You got no idea about the battles that God is fighting for you. Look over in uh, chapter 41. He talks about uh, Leviathan, and in the chapter before, he talks about something called behemoth. And we talk about, well, maybe those are dinosaurs or they're something else. But these are ancient pictures of chaos and destruction and evil and things that everybody was scared about. Job 38, uh, we talked about one of them. Uh, chapter 41, can you draw out, Job? Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Can you press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose and pierce his jaw with a hook? Are you powerful enough to control these forces of chaos? That's supposed to be Job uh, 41, verse 18. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. God says, Job, you know how dangerous this is in your mind? You got this idea. Do you know that I'm fighting against that for you? Down to verse 27. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. He's strong. He's powerful. Verse 33. On earth there is not his like a creature without fear. Job, did you know that I'm fighting all these battles against these cosmic forces, this, this huge battle against forces you don't even know about? Job, you got no idea about the battles that I fight for you. And maybe we're left with the idea that that was on purpose. That there's no way to know the answers to the questions of why does this happen? Why did it happen to me? Why did it happen to them? Why is there evil, pain, and suffering in the world? Job and his friends never learned what we knew when we started. In chapter 1, you learn about God meeting with the council. And you learn in chapter 1, I want you to, to see the words here. Look at Job chapter 1. Joe read it for us a few minutes ago. But, but see what happens here. There was a day in verse 6, Job 1 verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them. Huh, interesting. And the Lord said to the Satan, from where have you come? He seems to be surprised that this person is there. And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it, it seems like he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, as Peter writes it in the New Testament. And the Lord said to the Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on earth, blameless, upright, who fears God and turns away from evil? And he answered the Lord and said, does, jo does Job fear you for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side. This is important. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. So here's what's happening. There's this meeting of God, and he's ruling the universe in his great uh, power and wisdom. And this adversary, the accuser, the Satan, shows up. And God seems to be surprised. What are you doing here? He says, well, I've been, where you been? I've been, you know, on the earth, going to and fro, trying to find some people to devour. What about Job, right? You think you have a better plan than I do. What about Job? You, you ever thought about him? He's, he's great. There's nobody like him. He's upright. He shuns evil. You can't get him. And Satan says, you know, he's only serving you because you're protecting him. He's only serving you because you're fighting his battles for him, right? You, you know that, God. Take away that hedge of protection. Take away that comfort. Stop fighting the battles. And I bet Job will curse you to your face. Job never knows that that happened. These are the last times that the Satan is mentioned in this entire book. So even through all the, the loss of family, the loss of his stuff, his livelihood, his possessions, his house, his wife, even through these difficult conversations that he has with his friends, all through the blame game that his friends play against Job and Job plays against God, through all of that, you're never going to read about what really happens. 
they never know what we know. But this was not so much a test of Job, it was a test of God and his power and wisdom in ruling the universe. And so Job never has a full understanding of why bad things have happened to him. And so in their finite minds, his friends come around and say, well, Job, best thing we can figure out is that you've done something wrong because God is right and God's not going to punish you arbitrarily. And so you must have messed up in the past and you brought this upon yourself. You stop it and things are going to improve for you. They say that because they have no clue what you and I already know. They don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And Job says, well, no, 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 no. I know that I haven't done anything wrong. I'm righteous. I'm upright. I shun evil. It, it can't be that. And so it just must be that God has turned his back on me. That's best I can figure out. And Job thinks he's figured that out because he has no clue what you and I found out in the first 10 verses of the book. It's never revealed to him. They never know. Maybe that's the point. Because that's a story that we can take. And if you ask me, why, do, why does evil happen in the world today? I could jump through some hoops I think I could try to explain some reasons why, but at the end of the day, I don't know. If you ask me more pointedly, why did this terrible thing happen to me and my family? I could probably give you a, a decent intellectual answer. But at the end of the day, I still don't know. Like Job, there are things behind the scenes, complexities in creation, vast expanse, battles that God is fighting that you and I have no clue about. Maybe that's the point. It's tempting for us to blame others, maybe to blame ourselves, but more tempting is the draw to blame God for the evil, the pain, and the suffering that happens in our lives. Augustine did it. John Calvin did it. Countless people do it in our world today. But you and I, I think we can do better than that. I know that we can do better than that. We think God is a God of love, compassion, care, kindness, mercy. Not a God who Job described as an adversary, as the culprit, as a destroyer, as a God who mocks whenever they go through hard times. That is not the picture of God that we have. The picture that we have of God is a God who wants good for us. A God who doesn't will evil into existence, doesn't will the pain in our lives to be there, doesn't will the suffering in the world, but admits that it is present in his vast, complex creation and strives to do what he can do using his power and his wisdom to bring good in whatever we experience today. That's Romans 8. For those who love God and are called on purpose, God makes all things work together for good. It never says that all things are going to be good. That's not there. It never says that God brings the not good things into your life. What he says is that whatever's there, however unexplainable it may be, God can use it to bring good for you, for your family, for all those around you. There's an old fable that I'd like to leave you with. The poorest guy in the uh, town had the best-looking horse, the white stallion. He was the poorest man in the village, but he owned the most beautiful white stallion, and the king had offered him a small fortune for it. After a terribly harsh winter, during which the old man and his family nearly starved, the townspeople came to visit, and they said, Old man, you can hardly afford to feed your family. Sell the stallion. You'll be rich. If you don't, you're a fool. It's too early to tell, said the old man. A few months later, the old man woke up to find the white stallion had run away. Once again, the townspeople came, and they said to the old man, See, if you would have just sold that king your horse, you'd be rich. Now you've got nothing, you fool. It's too early to tell, said the old man. A couple of weeks later, the white stallion returned, and along with it came three other white stallions. Old man, the townspeople said, we are the fools. Now you, old man, you can sell that stallion to the king, and you've got three stallions left. 
You're so smart. Too early to tell, said the old man. The following week, the old man's son, his only son, was breaking in one of the stallions and was thrown off, crushed both of his legs. And the townspeople say, paid a visit to him, and they said, Old man, if you had just sold that stallion to the king, you'd be rich. You wouldn't have got those other stallions that had to be broken. Your son would not be crippled. You are a fool, old man. Too early to tell, he said. The next month, war broke out with the neighboring village, and all the young men in the village were sent into the battle, and all were killed. And again, the townspeople came, and they cried to the old man, We have lost our sons, and you are the only one who has not. If you'd sold your stallion to the king, your son too would be dead. Old man, you are so smart. His response, too early to tell. A lot of bad things happen to good people. Too early to tell. Why is there evil, pain, and suffering in our world? Too early to tell. Why could Job not figure out why he was stricken with all these things? Too early to tell. Why could his friends not figure out any reason but, well, I guess Job's just messed up something in his life? Too early to tell. In our lives, I think there's comfort in knowing that some things it is still too early to tell. Especially when it comes with so much force in our own personal lives. Too early to tell why that happened. But what I can tell is that God made this creation with you in mind. And what I can tell is that there are many untold battles happening right now that God is fighting for you. We don't know what they look like. We don't know where it goes. It's too early to tell that. But I know that it happens. And what I can tell you is that evil is not a part of God's will. It's in direct contrast to his will. That's why he tells us that our job as Christians is to find out where those pockets of evil may be and to attack them. That's why he tells his early church, his first followers, I will build my church, my group of people, my followers, my disciples, and those gates of hell, that's a defensive front, those gates of hell will never prevail against it. It's too early to tell what that looks like and how that plays out. But I know that it's there. That's why he tells his church in the early writings, Go out into a dark generation and shine as lights. Be the light of the world. Overcome evil with good. That's what we're talking about. I don't know how it plays out. I know there's terrible things happening. I know that evil is there. I know that suffering is present. But I know that the job of Christians is to look at it and say, okay, I can't explain how it happened or why it's here. It's too early to tell. But how will I respond to it in my life? That's the question. Maybe you're here this morning. Evil's happening around you. Maybe you're succumbing to it. Maybe you've questioned God through this. Job did. Maybe you've blamed God for some of these things. Job clearly did. Maybe you realize it's too early to tell, but that's not the God that we know. It's not the God that we serve. Maybe those things have gotten you off course and caused you to second guess your faith in Christ. Maybe today's the day that you decide, you know what? I've been wrong about this. It's led me astray. I want to get back right. Doesn't mean you walk down an aisle. It can happen in the pew just as well as it can happen on the front row. Maybe you're here and not a Christian. And the only way this makes sense, we can't explain why everything happens in this world. If we can't explain why the bad things exist today, maybe it's because we're holding out hope for a better place, a better existence, a better life. But that's only for those who are in Christ, for those who love God and are called on purpose, Romans 8. So maybe today is the day that if you are outside of Christ that you decide this is the day that I get it right. This God doesn't make evil. Instead, he confronts evil on the cross and makes a way for me to be right with him. So maybe today if you want to respond in faith, turn away from your sins and be baptized into Christ. Those sins are washed away. You live a new life. Where sometimes there will be questions. Where sometimes it is too early to tell why things happen but a life in which you respond to the evil that you do encounter the best way possible. And that is through the love and the mercy and the grace poured out from the cross. Today, if there's any way that you want to respond to this invitation, any change you want to make in your life, any way that we can be praying for you and for yours, we invite you to come make those concerns known right now while we stand and while we sing this song.